Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everybody in between, welcome to another episode of the Chaps Chat Cats. My name's Jake, and I'm joined in the virtual studio by Sambo and Johnny. How are we, chaps? Pretty good. Yes, not too bad, not too bad. Can't complain. I can. Uh, but listen. Can. But no one will just <laughs> Never. comedy gold mine. It's yep. um <laughs> on the show tonight here on the Hoops Crew Media Network. Uh we have Cats v Tigers round eight AFLW recap. Um, so we will try our best not to be too depressing as the cats tumble to their fifth loss uh in eight Almost matches no this thing. season. Yeah, um, so we're going to get into all of that. Then on the Patreon part of the show, we're going to duck over and we're going to talk about what we want to see. Normally we do a what we want to see segment for each game when we preview it. We're going to have a look at what we want to see in the last three games this year for the AFLW Cats. You know, whether that's a team focused thing, it's an individual player focused thing. That's what we're going to dial in on over there. So go on over and start your seven-day free trial on the Hoops Crew Patreon. And of course, before we get into the show, chaps, we've got to say a big Hoops Crew Media Network thank you to our network sponsor, Cyril Cook Florist. You can go on over and visit them at www.cyrilcookflorist.com. Dot au that's cook with an e. You can phone them up on zero three five triple two double two double four. Or if you want to make uh, make use, I was going to say make sense of. There's nothing to make sense of. It's only to make use of uh, a twenty percent in store discount from Cyril Cook Forest. That's right. If you go on over and visit them at Shop Twelve Eleven Leather Street in Breakwater, tell them that the Hoops Crew sent you, and they will give you twenty percent off your next in store purchase. Not five, not ten, not fifteen, but twenty percent. Uh, Thanks a bunch to Cyril Cook, our media network sponsor. Chaps, we've got to get into it though. And I'll start off by recapping how it all broke down on Saturday afternoon. I'm still lost as to what uh, day these things happen. Such is the nature of the condensed AFLW season. Um, but th this is how the game unfolded. Relatively even passages of play to open the match. Um, the team's trading behind. It was uh, Greiser for Richmond, the first score of the day. Prasparkas, a score after three and a half minutes for the Cats. Uh, Jackie Parry for the Cats are behind. Uh, Eilish Sheeran are behind for the Tigers. So it was 2-2. Two, two. And then Kate Sermon on her return to the side, broke the deadlock, got the first goal on the board after 10 minutes and 50 seconds. The Cats would do the final scoring of the opening term, a behind that was rushed. That allowed them to take a 1-3-9 to two behinds lead. Richmond almost had the first goal of the second term. Grace Egan, a behind after 40 seconds. The Cats, a flurry of scores. Nina Morrison, a behind, a rush behind. Gabby Featherston, a behind. The Cats at this point up one goal, six to three behinds. And look, I don't know about you chaps, but I feel like we all knew where this was probably headed. One, six up midway through, um, you know, one, six to three behinds midway through the second term. The Tigers then peel off a behind to Katie Brennan, a goal to Amelia Yassia, a behind to Mon Conti, a goal to Mon Conti to storm out to a 2-5-17 to 1-6-12 lead at the half. The Tigers, they kicked the first score of the second half, a rush behind, so not so much kicked as rushed. The Cats took control of the game, seemingly. Goals to Ashling Maloney and Jackie Parry in quick succession. But the Tigers, they hit straight back. Yasir again on the spot after 12 and a half minutes. Geelong, they had their chances after that. Two behinds, one to Ashling Maloney, one to Darcy Maloney. That left Geelong up 3 8 26 to 3 6 24. The Tigers, they had their chances early in the four, uh, fourth quarter. Katie Brennan are behind, a behind to Mon Conti, a rush behind. The Cats hit the front. Jackie Parry, her second goal of the day. But 
just four minutes later, Eilish Sheeran put the Tigers back in front. Monconti, her third behind of the day, had the chance to extend the lead for the Tigers, but it was Kate Darby who put Geelong in front with only about four and a half minutes left in the game. Maybe they could hold on. Sadly, they couldn't. It was two goals in the final five minutes to the Tigers. Yassir with her third of the game. Either side of a behind, oh, and Katie Brennan, her first of the match, either side of a behind to Michaela Bowen. Geelong falling short, 5-9, 39-6-10, 46. Um, Johnny, I'll come to you first here. Geelong's... The campaign pretty much in tatters. I know we can talk mathematics. Cat's still only six points out of the eight, but like another game that followed almost the exact game script as the rest of the season, John. Yeah. Yeah, it was very, very disappointing. And yet again, I feel like we've come on this podcast a lot lately going frustrating, disappointing loss yet again. And it feels like, yeah, as you said, just a state of play at the moment. Um, just frustrated that we couldn't finish the job yet again but to be fair I thought this was a game where the Cats looked the most competitive throughout the entire game where everyone was at a really good level all pressure and well the pressure was good they weren't all just chasing one player there was lots of good tackles lots of good spoils the defense held up really well it's just we couldn't get that scoreboard pressure on yet again which was the most frustrating part is just like we had so many good opportunities to get some couple of really good goals and both times a few like especially in that first quarter i think i counted about two of those goals we should have gotten um and then throughout the rest of the game i think we should have kicked at least we probably could have kicked like six more goals so it's tough when you leave them out there. And, you know, the Tigers can be saying the same thing. They probably could have won this game by more if they were a bit more accurate. And unfortunately, they were just one more goal more accurate than us and a couple of points more accurate than us, unfortunately. But overall, if this was, I don't know, like if I was going to say if this was early in the season, you'd be a bit more optimistic. But this happened at the start of the season and we were optimistic and it still didn't work out but yeah it's just it's just frustrating that we can see how well they're playing it just you can't get that pressure on the scoreboard and as soon as you can't get that pressure on you pile the pressure on yourself you start getting a bit more tense going for goal and i think that sort of happened and it happened to both teams at certain points as well where they just didn't really go through the motions when they're kicking goals or whatnot but yeah, again, just left feeling a bit deflated, a bit frustrated. Um, I watched it again on replay because I was working when this game was live. I checked the scores and I was like, oh, this is this is close. We'll just get another goal here. And then, unfortunately, Richmond got the last two. That second last goal, though, I was very annoyed by. I, I didn't think that was really warranted as a free kick against Parry. I didn't, didn't see what more she could have done in that situation, but I guess that's the state of the game. But, yeah, it's just really, really frustrating the way that we just can't kick a winning score at the moment. Yeah, I, I just did a rough count of how we've scored this year by my count. And again, this is just very quickly while you were talking 48 goals, 60 behinds this year, which on paper doesn't sound too bad, but you know, there's, there's games, you know, where it's, it's cost us, <laughs> you know, mm. the, and, and it, because you, you, you look at a game like the, the Fremantle game as for instance, three, nine, 27 to six, nine, 45. Um, it's when these misses are happening. It, it it feels like it's it's particularly first half. Like I almost took a screenshot um, during that uh, midway through that second quarter when we were up one goal six to three behinds, and it's like seven scoring shots to three. You just knew the other foot was going to drop, 
And so it wasn't very surprising when it did. And it's just like, I feel like this is like Groundhog Day. We keep being in this situation where you hear the commentators say something, Sam, like um, cats, they'd be happy with their early dominance here, but they'd love to have put it on the scoreboard. It's just like you could pretty much pre-record the broadcast from another game and put it on our performances this year. What what were your sort of takeaways from from, from the game? I mean, yeah, all largely similar to everything you you guys have said. I think, I think I do see. I don't know if progress, but I see change with the results. Like I didn't necessarily feel like like it it did come around in you know a, a similar on paper as we're saying a similar way. A lot of behinds, a lot of early chances missed. Um, but I felt like it didn't necessarily get there in the same way. Like I actually, I actually feel like our inside fifty deliveries were probably the best they've been this year. Um, uh, and that's probably reflected, you know, our marks inside 50. It was only, only seven, but I think there's, there's been games there where we've taken like two. Um, yeah, I thought, I thought some of the kicks to, to parry on the lead and to Maloney, I thought there was some good deliveries, you know, parry dropped back a little bit occasionally and she was the one kicking inside. Julia Crocker grills did some great deliveries inside. So I, um, and there was a bit of variety to those as well. There was some of those, I'm going to take the mark and I'm going to lay off a handball, you know, and it often didn't work. We often missed the shot, didn't make the distance. There was a couple of shots that absolutely scrubbed. Like, I think that's probably the other part about the scoreline is that, yeah, we were, you know, however many behinds, nine, nine was it in the end? Yeah, nine. But there was probably, you know, another six shots that didn't make the distance or, you know, went out went out on the floor or were marked that don't come up on the scoreboard. So I think it kind of looks like we were only slightly more inefficient than Richmond, but I think we were actually quite, a bit more inefficient on the um with the actual shot conversion um but uh but again not 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 massively so and richmond also could have just kicked a bit straighter and as john said taken the the result even further but yeah i did think i did think there was evolution but i felt like the probably the the lingering problem that maybe was i don't want to say the worst but certainly noticeably sort of holding us back to me was our handball game. Um, I was really glad to see that we handballed less. I think we're at 92 um, handballs this time, uh, which is only slightly down. Our, our season average is 98.8. But on the last couple of games, I think it's considerably down, uh, which I was happy to see because I did just feel like it's, it's just that punchy kind of like someone's running through just – just hit them on the chest as they run. I just, we just couldn't get it right. I actually felt like towards the end of the game that started to improve a bit um, in the, in the, in the last quarter. That's, I think that's actually where some of our sort of ability to turn it over and, you know, and keep up with them did come from was those chains. But I'd say for 75% of the match, I kind of sat there watching the game with my hands on my head, just waiting for the inevitable handball. That there was two, it was like, oh, that one wasn't quite there. Or oh, that one, she had to stop to pick it up. Or oh, that one, she had to really lean back. And then this fourth handball just completely misses it. Or like, you know, we've just, the, it just interrupted the flow enough that Richmond were able to structure up around us, either lay a direct tackle or just, you know, run back, mark up and um, structure up ahead of us. So it's only a small thing, but it really felt to me like just the fundamental of a, a really punchy, striking handball in stride um, was the thing that we were just lacking consistently. Um, I, like John said, I thought our pressure was pretty good. I thought our off-ball structure was pretty good. I did feel like the delivery into the 50 had improved um, quite noticeably. But yeah, just that running gateway. I think we just made, even then we, though we did then do those deliveries inside 50 well, I think we made our, our day really hard for ourselves by just not having that run and that, that really successful overlapping kind of run and carry and handball game on point. So that was, the, I think that was the, the main takeaway for me. As Jake and I said and- last week, it really, that talk of the you know, handballing and the run and gunning style of play that cats are usually really good at just empathizes how much when we see Amy McDonald in that center square in that midfield area where she can get the handball and get it out to a play really clean yeah really, I think, really I, think well. I was there for that Let, one, but yeah I agree I think you were actually I can't yeah. remember time is 
weird but yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, i've missed yeah. a lot i've missed a lot the only reason i think i was because <laughs> i actually do remember that and i've missed most yeah. spots um, yeah, yeah I, it's tough crazy absolutely about the handballing sometimes we're just putting ourselves in too much hot water on our own with just by ourselves without richmond really having to do much we're just getting ourselves into that silly position that we shouldn't be in the unforced error element of it was was kind of frustrating to me. Like you're talking about that, that you know, like a crisp, punchy handball, Sambo. There's a great example, and I'm not trying to single this player out because they were the only one to do it. But it's just the most clear example that stuck in my head was Kate Darby getting a, a either a kick. She received a disposal in the middle of the ground, turns, and she's got Nina Morrison and I can't remember who it was streaming to her left. And essentially yeah, puts it, was... it behind Morrison, but too shallow for the next person to come and get. And it's just Enjoy a turnover that. in the middle of the field. Yeah. And, and it was just like, uh, that could have been a counterattack. And there were not mo- numerous am- amounts of times where just, I thought the kicking skills were in general pretty good, but the handball skills, like I think really let us down the, the ability to gather Again, it felt like another game in which the majority of our players were playing with like a helium filled footy, where it was just like it was just bouncing over them and up on their shoulder. And like they just weren't gathering it off that first bounce. Um, a couple of them do. Ashling Maloney, I thought, looked in ridiculous touch. Um, mm. But, you know, it's just those half seconds that you lose when you don't control it off that first initial, sh- you know, bounce off the ground when it doesn't just sit up in your hand right and allows them to close, and Richmond were good with their pressure as well. But a couple of other things, chaps, kind of stood out to me where I, I thought we really played our way into trouble. Um, and one of them is, um, you know, a shot from Georgie Prasparkas. And I know someone pointed this out a few weeks ago, and I had never really – it must have been a bit of a blind spot for me. But there was a tweet saying, you know, Georgie Prasparkas really needs to learn – to use the left, this constant like kicking on the outside of her right boot, like it works sometimes, but it it, it feels like there's a you, you're walking a bit of a tightrope about whether it ends up where you want it to, or 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 it doesn't. And that was the shot for goal, you know, where she breaks free of traffic about thirty meters out and has to snap back on the outside of her right boot. Whereas if you can just throw it onto your left, I feel like there's a greater chance of making good connection with the ball. And then the other one that stuck out to me was Chantal Emanson on the wing decides to play on around the player on the mark towards the boundary side. Now, as far as I'm aware, Chantal Emanson's a right footed player. Mm. Um, yeah. So she plays out towards the near boundary. So plays herself into a situation where she's got a kick on her non-preferred foot ends up sort of having to do like a snap ball back towards the 50 and it's turned over and it goes back the other way. And it's just like, I don't know, just need, just doing too much. Just situations where it's like, we're not taking just a simple option and doing a very simple thing. Well, and, and it's like, we're trying to bite it all off at once. It's like, we can do 100 meter kick or, you know, one in, in, in one play. You know, one player feels they can do it all and and get us the goal or get us the opportunity. It's it's not built like that. Like I, I think that I think Richmond probably played more connected team footy. I think that's something you said a few weeks ago, um, Sambo, and you probably said it as well, Johnny. About like we just seem to be lacking some basic fundamental connection that we mm. had last year. Do yeah. it, yeah. We just definitely don't have that connection and. Richmond really didn't have a lot of connection throughout the entire game. I feel, I feel like it was two teams that were very much at the similar level of play style, skill, ability, um, leadership and all that combined. Like Both teams were very evenly matched. And Richmond just had those moments where they were just that little bit more connected for longer during the game and were able to either get out the back or get themselves out of a tricky situation to buy as you, as you said Joe, playing to the easy position or playing to the easy player at the back or in a better position where the cats sort of just continuously sometimes get ourselves in 
into really tough positions by our own doing. There was some really good moments where they were able to play around Richmond's defence and get it to those players in really good, good positions and set up a couple of really good goals. There was one good handball by, I think it was Georgie Prisparkas, who was, had a sore player in the centre, gave a really big handball into the centre, and then they are able to have the time and space to look for a player inside 50. I don't think, think it ended up in a goal, but it was just that idea of not always looking forward, but looking back and finding that player back in space, which I feel like the Cats just aren't doing as much this year as they were last year. It feels like it's all got to be, we've got to go forward, we've got to get inside 50 and score goals. And then I think sometimes they just forget I we can go back and we can relieve that pressure and find better positions and do switches. I don't know. I felt like too, we probably didn't use the the width of the ground enough. At times I felt like we were trying to force it centrally. Um, and then there was a few times where we were trying to come out of the back. I think that's one thing that stood out to me. Like you look at our disposal efficiency, the players with lowest disposal efficiency for us, Anna Rose Kennedy, 0%, Meg McDonald, 28%. Um, Melissa Bragg, who sort of plays down back as well as in the ruck, 33%. Claudia Gunjaka, 40%. Like some of those players, like Anna Rose Kennedy particularly, there was a kick there where she was trying to bring the ball out from the back where she tries to hit space on the wing. And there's just no, like, there's no Geelong player there. It's like everyone's staying sort of central. And, you know, maybe that's on the kicker for not kicking to the plan. But at the same time, it's like, you can't only go down the center. You need to stretch them out wide a bit as well. And yeah, I don't know. It's just like people just not on the same page. That that's what it felt like. And and um and I think you can talk about like what we're missing. You know, Amy McDonald, Chloe Shear, two extremely important players. We're playing down really a starting ruck, but you know. Then there's some just moments in there like glaring misses too inside the Ford 50, which, you know, I know it's it's more painful the, for the players than us, but, you know, we're here on a podcast is what we're talking about. Like the one where Nina Morrison's walking, you know, sort of running clear from about 20 out and just pushes it wide. And you just go, yeah. how much where she hit the post? Hell? Sorry? Was that the one where she hit the post? No, I just went, um, missed, mate, just went on just the right. Again. Yeah, just yeah, was, open goal. Ashley Maloney had another one that like was going to be an unbelievable goal, and it clips the post. And you're just like these little things, these little margins. Or that other one back there. To haunt you. She was running in and gave the handball to Darcy, and it's like just go for goal, just yeah. go, just back yourself. It, if you miss, you miss. You get a, a behind. You get a point. At least it's something, but yeah, just I, I don't. I don't think Darcy Maloney was expecting it because she sort of got it and dropped it straight away, and then Richmond were on them. And I think if Ashling just went for goal, it could have gone for a goal or for a behind, and we could have trapped it in there well, a bit the, easier. The other thing too is you know kicking it behind that was late in the game, a couple of minutes left. Like mm. it also forces them to kick out from the back. Yeah. You know, so you're a point closer. It was only like a two or three point game at that point, but um, yeah, it's. I think what's frustrating for me most chaps is just like that. If this was a game we played like three years ago, we'd have been like that was like bloody good effort. You know, really mm. good effort. Um, you know, a very it was great Richmond crowd. I thought I was pretty impressed by the number of people there. The you know, how vocal they were. And you would have sort of given a bit of a salute and gone pretty decent effort. But like, we know that this team is capable of winning that game. Um, um, do you feel like the cats you... got a bit sucked in by Richmond's kind of like the push and shove? I thought we, we really let ourselves, I don't know, just get taken up in that. Um, like, 
they they obviously picked at uh, picked at a wound for us. We were, they you know we were frustrated, and I it was one of the few times I've really seen the cats probably you know get sucked in to a bit of push and shove and biff when they probably should have just concentrated on playing the football. I don't know is that is an unfair comment. Yeah, I think it's very true. I think different players are different too. Like, I think there's certain players that can take that as fuel. Like, I actually think, I actually think Parry is someone that, um, uh, like, she does remind me of Jeremy Cameron in that way. Like, she's the kind of person that I think could probably get involved in a bit of lip and then turn around and do exactly what she just said she was going to get do and, you know, give give it to him back a little bit. Like, I think she can use it as fuel. And then there's other players that I think it, I think it gets under their skin and it can, it can, um it can muck them up a little bit. Like I, I, f- I felt like it got to Claudia a little bit. Like I think that she maybe had got sucked into it a little. She came over to help someone else actually, when there was a bit of a shove going on. So she wasn't actually initially involved. And, but then after that point, I know she was, you know, getting the brunt of it a lot. She was getting involved in it again. Um, and then, you know, she made a little bit of a mistake at some point in that, like, I think it really just, she wasn't able just to kind of take a breath and, and and play footy, speak to speak with the football sort of thing, uh, which is totally un- totally understandable. Like that, you know, <laughs> I can absolutely uh, like understand that happening. But yeah, I think I think you're right. But I do think it varies from player to player. I think some players are able to really use that as fuel, and other players need to sort of learn how to shut out the noise uh, and just get on with business. Um, particularly okay. probably if you're in the back line, I think you know. Mm. I think if you're in the back line, yeah. I think you you've got to do your best just to. To, to focus and not get too rattled. I yeah, think Darcy right. Maloney is actually a player, and I know we love the toughness. I wouldn't mind if we saw her kind of just put that away a bit. I'm like, maybe I'm being harsh, but I feel like it's now a signal of like the game isn't going where I want it to go. Yeah, okay. And so now I'm involved in a bit of biff. And and I and I she's such a good player. Like remember that goal she kicked to win us a game against West Coast um, a couple of seasons ago. It was a direct hit out, Fuller to Webster. Darcy Maloney's on the spot streaming inside fifty, kicks the goal, and we win it. Like at, I don't know, it's thirty seconds to go or something. Yeah. And I remember a couple of seasons ago she was on our stonks list as like the ceiling is super high. And I feel like this year's been a bit. Uh, there's been a bit of stagnation, and I sometimes now look at it and just go like, "I think you've just kind of shown your hand a bit." Like, and, and I can relate as a player who was easily wound up when things weren't going my way when I played sport. <laughs> you've you've kind of just shown where your head's at a, a, a little bit, and and I feel like maybe I wouldn't mind just seeing her just keep her head down a bit. Um, but there was a few players, I thought, who uncharacteristically got involved in stuff. And that's a, I think it's a good point, Sambo, you make about Gunjaka. And, and and when you play down back, like there's less room for that because any mm. area you make out of emotion down back is so much more costly. Um, and, and you talked about Parry and how she's that player who can give a bit of lip and then turn around and do what she said she was going to do. Mon Conti did that. Chris Barkas mm-hmm. got into Conti after something happened in the Ford 50 and like two minutes later, she sinks a crucial goal. And it's, yeah, sometimes you don't want to poke the bear too much. Um, did you chaps want to do votes here and then get into a little bit more conversation, maybe more about general players? Or did you have more general game notes to make um, from a team, team-wide team standpoint? I probably don't really like, I feel like we've no. maybe glossed over the positives, but I do think we have mentioned them. I think John covered most of the positives in terms of the structure and the, and the uh, tackling and the supporting each other that way and all that kind of stuff. So I think, I think well, I've kind of emptied, our... emptied my notebook to, for the most do part. Our... So I'm happy to go into votes. Do our votes and then do players that also were closer to votes. Talk about the positive players. I'll just say too, like to to touch on it, the pressure was good. Mm. Like I, I just want to sort of reinforce. I'm sure one of you guys already mentioned it that the pressure was good. I just I would second that. I thought our tackling was good. Um, 
Richmond's was too, but I thought we were up up for the fight. Um, I I again just I felt like bad for Derby having to play this thankless role in mm. the ruck. Um, it was good you know, that she going got a goal. Poppy. Yes, really good goal. Oh, she's a fan. That that's what's it frustrating. She's a fantastic player. Yeah, and she's I been forced a, to play a fantastic on... second tier ruck too. Yeah, like I, I thought yeah. it was one of the probably close to her best game she's played, and yeah, some really crucial moments she had throughout the game, especially that goal. That goal was super crucial, and if if we could just hold on, we would have been a match winning goal. But yeah, yeah, she played really well and rucked really well as well. Like held her own against a very powerful ruck player. But yeah, and, and then you just look at it statistically for context. Like Poppy Kelly, the <laughs> ruck for the Tigers, fifteen <laughs> disposals to Derby's nine, um, thirty nine hitouts to thirteen. Two goal assists, like it, and 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 something that I think too, you can't discount is that it's not just the ruck stuff. When you've got a player that's big enough, tall enough, strong enough, and, and capable enough with their body to to dominate the ruck, they also impact the game in other areas. Like when you want to kick long down the line to mm. a contest, they've got the advantage in that situation. So. Um, all right, yeah, let's let's do votes and then we'll we'll talk about some other players who we thought were were close to it. Um, Sambo, get us underway with your one vote, and then Johnny, and then me. Shoot, hold on, I've got to bring it back up. This is another week, just like last week, where I, I chopped and changed a lot, to be honest. Mm, yeah. Um, and so I'll I will say too that I the while we're talking about Derby, and while I wait for this to load up, so I can remind myself who I gave my one to. <laughs> Um, I, I did think, I thought Bragg did some good stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, like again, somewhat thankless, but, and it was mostly early. I thought, I thought she did sort of disappear a little. Um, but I thought early she did a couple of good things. Um, so I ended up giving my one vote to Jackie Parry. who was, I think, yeah, she was, she was almost my, almost could have been my three really, honestly. Um, if not for a very obvious one floating around in there. Uh, yeah. Nice. Um, Johnny, who'd your one vote go to? I'm giving my one vote to Georgie Prasparkas. I thought this was by far her best game of the year and what we've been missing from Georgie throughout this year when she wasn't injured. And I think that injury has taken us some time to get back to what we expect of her. It's still not at the... A level that she would be wanting to put out there or what we should be expecting. But I thought it was a good step in her going back to what she can do is be that player to bring other players in, get that freak goal, get that good kick inside 50. I thought we started to see a bit more today. And, yeah, there was just some nice plays throughout the game that I thought she was involved in. And just getting her body in, uh, in there and amongst it and breaking out of tackles. I thought, yeah, she really got ahead in the game and was like, this is my game to put an impact on, put a big impact in. Um, and I was, yeah, very happy to see her get to somewhat back to her best. And hopefully she can continue this into the next last, into the next three games. Yep. Um, I went one vote. Who did I go to? Uh, Nina Morrison, I thought she sort of flashed, you know, that ability. There's all these times where you think she's going to be tackled and she she ducks and weaves and finds space where you don't think there is any. 22 disposals, equal high for the Cats. Seven clearances, equal game high, four tackles, a goal assist. I mean, it would have been the perfect game almost if she'd slotted, you know, that goal chance, um, which has seemed harsh to say, but... Um, you know, it, it really could have been a match-winning performance from Nina Morrison. So yeah, I, I gave her one one vote. Um, we'll we'll snake back the other way. I'm going to give two votes to Jackie Parry. Um, she's she's been so impressive this year. Again, like she was, I think one of our most improved players last season, and 
you could almost say it again. And I don't know if that's mm. just because she's maintained the level, but I'd say she's marking the ball even more confidently. Um, and the fact yep. that they now swing her down back when they're in trouble, I think, I think it speaks to a number of things um, that we won't get into in the votes, but I, I think it certainly raises a bit of a flag there um, that they're sending her down back. Uh, who was your two votes, Johnny? Uh, Jackie Perry as well. Same reasons. Sambo? Uh, Julia Crocker Grills. Um, I, I think it was, it was a bit of a, I do think it was a bit of a loaded, an early loaded decision. Like I think I'd put her in my votes well before the game was over. So, um, so it was one of those, was one of those performances where when I did read the stats, I went, Oh, maybe not quite as impactful as I thought, but enough that I, I wanted to stick with her. I thought, um, and maybe not in the ways you'd think she was going to impact either. Like, um, she didn't necessarily, uh, she didn't kick any, any goals or even any behinds. I don't think, I don't think she hit the scoreboard at all. Um, but she laid a, you know, a few tackles and, and just her, her presence, um, uh, defensively is really important as well. Signified by the, the fact that she had team high intercept possessions, which I, I had noted, like, I felt like she was able to slide across and cut off a lot of Richmond forward push. Um, so, and it was equal game high intercept possessions actually. Um, but also I think, I think her, I think her attacking, um, her, her forward pushing instincts are really good. And had that handballing game been a little bit better, a little bit more on point, I think she could have hit, hit, uh, hit the scoreboard and just hit the game a little bit harder. Um, I felt like the options she was, she was presenting was really good, but oftentimes when the, the handball delivery came to her, it forced her to slow down and that breakaway speed was kind of lost. Um, obviously this person had an incredible game, but you know, it was a couple of times it was actually Ashley Maloney that scooped it up to hand pass it to JCG and just the, the kind of awkward, or, you know, looked like her palm probably copped more of the hand pass <laughs> than the actual ball. And, and, you know, it was, you know, then JCG had to slow down. She was kind of at, at, at a loss in the pocket with zero momentum and Richmond were able, able to kind of muddy it up. Um, so yeah, I, I, I couldn't couldn't look past it to be honest. I I, thought, I feel like her impact is really versatile at the moment. She might hit the scoreboard, and she doesn't hit the scoreboard. She's taking intercept possessions. You know, she might get an absolute crap ton of tackles, but when she's not, you know, she's she's providing inside fifties and score assists. So yeah, I think she's um, I think she's as we said a week or two ago, she's in career best form. I think. Nice. And I, I don't know, I'd, I'd have to look back at the the numbers from previous years, but, you know, again, another game where she's got more uncontested touches than contested. I feel like that's mm. not how she started out, you know, like she no. is she is operating a bit more in space now. And, and, yeah, I agree. She had a really good game. Give us your three then, Sambo. Uh, my three were Ashling Maloney. Um, I think, <laughs> yeah, just one of those one of those obvious choice moments. Pretty hard to look past, just a, like a incredibly impressive stat line, like to read the stat sheet, but also just, just from an eyeball point of view, watching the game, you know, it was, it was, she's so close. Like I'm not, I don't want to take anything away from what she's doing, but she's so close to absolutely tearing a game open and just being like unstoppable and giving people a, absolute nightmares at the moment. She's really, I think she is copying some attention. People are really starting to defensively focus on her, but, I think I think yeah, she's really close to having not just a game, but like a career of just highlight after highlight after highlight. Yeah, absolutely. Can't argue with that. So I'm not going to because my three votes is also Ashley Maloney. I mean, just just her ability, her speed, strength, and just knowing where the goals are or where a teammate is, or just had a ball may act when it's about to bounce is just incredible and just everything about how she just goes about this game is incredible what played what is about 20 if 20 games so far and she's already becoming an absolute superstar. seven according to the commentary team seven seven <laughs> games is an absolute freak of a player uh could be in the goal kicking score of the <laughs> 
goal kicking award this year quite easily. Like she's only one behind the player in front, so I think she could win it. And no surprising, I would not be surprised. She is a great player. Just a few things she needs to, as they say, level up in. But it's not going to take mm. much. It's not going to take much for her to level up her skills and become an absolute domination machine of this competition. And yeah, I agree with you, Sam. It won't be long before she's just dominating games. And there's, I've got a feeling that teams are not going to be able to stop her. I, I think like she's almost, you know, sometimes you look back at like those, um, like the Gary Ablett senior, like, you know, middle of his career stats where he was, you know, it was like 25 touches and seven goals, five, or, you know, like Ashley Maloney's like going to be close to doing the AFLW version of that at some point. Like the fact that like, I, I, there were times where she was playing, you know, outside of Ford 50 and she was looking like one of our best midfielders mm. and, and you start to go, well, geez, if we can't win the ball, like, why not just put her in, like, to to play alongside Morrison and stuff? Like, why can't she play on the outside of the stoppage and, and you just flick a hand pass out to Ashling Maloney because she's got speed and the ability to kick, you know, long and, and raking. Um, playing in defence. <laughs> yeah. She's she's a weapon. She can play anywhere. And yeah. it's, it's insane. Games. Channel it's just insane that KO commentary team 21 games she's played. Fools. And, and and to look like I thought she read the game better than almost anyone in terms yeah. of you know just her ability to get involved in the play. Um she's got great instincts, I think, and um she's everything you could have hoped for when the cats went and got her. And and she's only twenty one games into her career, so it's super exciting. Um, and you just you just hope that she's a cat forever for long term, and and that's and, why it's important to keep the winds rolling, so absolutely. that these players want to stay here. You can understand why not only Meg McDonald but the coach and several 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 other players went all went over to Ireland to convince her to come to the Cats. You can see why they mm. went that extra effort just to get her over the line. And it's, yeah, whatever they promised her, whatever they told her, whatever little white lies they sho shoved her away, it, it worked. And I'm glad they did because it's absolutely worth every single cent that whatever they had to do, it's worth it. Wow. I mean, you're talking about AFLW contracts. It probably was a matter of sense, yeah. John, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing she's your three votes as well, Jake. Take it seriously, for God's sake. I'm over it. I'm so over it. I'm so over it. Because what's frustrating is when they actually put a game on the weekend, like There's people fans. turn up. People turn up. It was a great crowd. It was a great, great atmosphere. Yeah. Um, it really does pay me off. But yeah, no, she's she's incredible. Um, she's a player you build around, you know, and 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 it probably is that thing, you know, where you go, if, again, what ifs? If Shear was in the side, you have Shear, Ashling Maloney, and Jackie Parry. Like, yeah, how, how do you stop them? Like, it's it's very it's tricky. Um Let's do a speed round here, chaps. Just one player each, literally speed round, 30 seconds each. Um, Sambo, I'll come back to you first, then you, Johnny, and then I'll close this out. Just a positive note um, on, on a player who you liked, saw some development from, et cetera. Go! Oh! I liked and saw some development. So, uh, well, Rachel Kearns, unfortunately, or <laughs> uh, Monty, unfortunately, went out again. But I, I actually thought she was potentially on her way to like a vote. Um, yeah, I, I felt, I felt like she's just getting. Obviously, we talk about her, you know, ferocity and her strength and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, and we, were, we were just talking about Maloney's game read. I think, I think um, Kearns' uh, game sense and 
vision for the game is is coming along like each week. Like you can see a progression of it, her ability to read players, read the ball. Um, and I think, yeah, I think she hits the contest like nobody else. She maybe might also be someone that needs to rein it in ever so slightly if she's going to keep going on with <laughs> concussions and injuries. Yeah. Um, because I did think we really, um, we did really lack that sort of cutthroat um, thing that she brings in the back line. Um, but yeah, she's probably my one. Nice. I'm going with Chantel Emerson. Um, yeah, it was like she was very close to getting to my votes, especially early on. I thought she was a big factor in the Cats' excellent defensive work and rebounding um, outside of 50. And I'm pretty sure she has like three intercept possessions. Uh, sorry, hang on. Where is she? Where is she? Where are you, Chantel? Um, three intercept possessions, three uh, three score involvements, and five inside fifties. And I think the game high and meters gain. So I thought it was a really, really good game from Chantel, and one that we've been missing from her. So hopefully, similar to Prisparkus, hopefully she can continue to build up from this for the next three games and end the season on a high. Eamonson probably a player who benefits when we play that like more kick to mark style. Mm. Like she's yeah. such a, you know, dead eye kick when you're hitting leads and that sort of thing that, you know, that's probably where she's at her best and probably was where she was at her best on the weekend. Um, I'm going to go with what's wrong. Yeah. Did I say something? No, I think so. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I someone laugh and I was like, oh, did I say something insulting? Um, I'm going to go with um, Michaela Bowen, 11 tackles. Um, you know, I just think talking about like the effort players who, who bring the same endeavor um, every week, Michaela Bowen's one of those players, 11 tackles. I reckon that would be a season high for her off the top of my head. Um, just never, never stops trying, never stops competing. Um, I actually feel like she's one of those players who tries to get in there and, and, and break up the conflict, um, mm. which I like. I'm, I'm sure she was a player who was getting in there trying to separate people, which is, yeah, the right instinct, I think, um, for mine. So, yeah, no, Michaela Bowen um, was just a player who was very close to getting in my votes as well. All right, we're going to duck over now onto the Patreon part of the show. We're going to talk about what we want to see from the final three games, one specific thing from each of us. So if you want to get that part of the show, go on over, start your seven-day free trial on the Hoops Crew Patreon. Uh, until next time, thanks so much for watching, listening, and supporting. Go Cats! Go Cats! Go Cats! Go Cats. Go.